Um, so now I um, am going to introduce Angeline Bruce. Um, Angeline, if we can spotlight Angeline, she's just going to give a bit of a wave because she's going to be here for questions um, at the end. But we're actually going to play uh, a video now that Angeline recorded earlier um, for you about her experiences. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Ange, I'm 47 years old and I have a 12 year old son who has diagnosed fetal alcohol spectrum disorder or FASD as it's known. I'm here today to try and bring awareness and to start a conversation around this mostly invisible disability. My belief is that behind every FASD child there are two stories. There is a story of the mother and there is the story of the child. So I'd like to start with my story. My story began with some early childhood trauma that was external to my family. I had an excellent nuclear family unit, a loving mum, dad and a brother, but I did suffer some external trauma. I found various ways to cope with that when I was a child, which didn't involve alcohol. And as I grew up, I found it an interesting social lubricant, but that's about all. And we'll fast forward to when I was 32 years of age and my, my mother was diagnosed with geoblastoma and subsequently passed away quite quickly. And that was the end of my nuclear family. My life was pretty much destroyed. I self-medicated with alcohol on that. A year later, I found out that I was unable to have children without IVF. I ended up falling pregnant at the age of 34 hopelessly alcoholic, I was not planning, I was not able to have a child as far as I knew. And so I was 34 years of age, pregnant with my miracle baby and hopelessly alcoholic. When I did find out I was pregnant, I am in the subset of women who were physically dependent on alcohol. I was self-medicating on my mother's death and I was also self-medicating on the fact that I couldn't have children. So you can see the irony in all this when I fell pregnant with my miracle baby. So this is where my story became my son's story. So I did everything that I possibly could throughout my pregnancy, except for, except for stop drinking, because that was something I was unable to do. So I ate properly, took prenatal vitamins, went to all of the prenatal appointments to make sure my son would have the very best amount of care. So I cut down drinking as much as I possibly could without withdrawing. I did tell, unfortunately, my OBGYN at my very first appointment that I was an alcoholic and that I was in full flight alcoholism. And I was told at that point that alcohol is no good for the baby and you must give up. And that was it, that was what I was left with. So I did continue telling my story, but I was very less forthcoming about it. It wasn't asked of me again, and I didn't bring it up. I didn't feel that I, I could, to be honest. Um, and it is super important to have conversations around this in a non-stigma, no blame, no shame. This is difficult stuff. This is really, really hard to talk about and the stigma runs so deep that I understand that nobody, you guys don't probably don't want to ask these kinds of questions. So at 33 weeks, I tried to stop drinking completely again, and I ended up in hospital on a drip to stop labor. It was too early for my son to be born at 33 weeks. I then came home and maintained again, and at 30, almost 36 weeks, I gave up again. I was just sick about the alcohol that was going in every day. Uh, I went into withdrawal, my water spontaneously broke, and my son was born eight hours later. So he was quite quick into the world. He was my first child and he was in a hurry. He was in distress. When he was born, it was a very, very silent three or four minutes before I heard my son cry. And I'm grateful every single day uh, that I heard that cry. He required 48 hours of nasal gastric feeding. He had a, a slow suck reflex and he also needed oxygen for 24 hours. I was relieved that he was born and that I wasn't drinking anymore and that he could 
just get the nutrients he needed and that he wasn't needing to get any of my alcohol anymore. So that brings us on to the next phase and that is getting diagnosis and finding out things about FASD. Whilst I was pregnant, I googled everything I possibly could, but the only thing I could really find were facial features, pictures of facial features. And because facial features occur in such a small percentage of these kids, that's all I could go on, facial features. So I'm desperately trying to look for facial features. He had failure to thrive. He found it difficult to put on weight and his sleeping was, he had a lot of colic problems also. I was desperately trying to believe that he would be fine, that I would be the one that, and he would be the one that would be fine. With the um, developmental milestones is when it started to show through. He crawled when he should have crawled and he pretty much walked when he should have walked. But his language was very, very delayed. He didn't speak and he's, he still has speech therapy to this day. Uh, there were eating problems, sleeping problems. And then of course, once he got a little bit older, three or four, we started to notice the social and emotional issues that he was having. At roughly three years of age, my son was diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. And of course I didn't think that this was correct at the time. I went to seek a second opinion, knowing that I was fairly confident it was more than that. And the second paediatrician I saw was a FASD formed paediatrician and it only took him two minutes. Yes, this child definitely has FASD with the information you have provided, with his delayed milestones and the fact that he's really starting to struggle socially and emotionally at the moment, that yes, this child definitely has FASD. So there was my diagnosis. And I'd like to say that that was the end of the story and that getting the diagnosis was a fabulous, fabulous thing. Then we needed to move on to the appropriate interventions and accommodations that my son required. This involved speech therapy, occupational therapy, and later on in life, when he, was, when he became 10, a psychologist. So my son has three fabulous therapists, all of which unfortunately didn't really know a lot about FASD. Unfortunately, when I rang to book them in and I was speaking to reception, they, I would be asked, does my son have a diagnosis of ASD? And I would say he doesn't, he has a diagnosis of FASD. And I would invariably be asked what that is. I actually find that to be really disheartening in this day and age and in this country and it must be terribly difficult for therapists as well. Being the, um, I, I must admit and I make no apologies, I am that parent. <laughs> so every therapist I provided with a pack of FASD information which included my son's diagnosis, his whisk report which had been pulled apart by a FASD informed psychologist so it actually shows his strengths and weaknesses in those different brain domains and his NDIS plan because he's now on the NDIS but that also took quite a bit of effort to get there and to their credit all of his, his therapists took this on board have accommodated him well his speech therapist is all of his therapists are fabulous his speech therapist has actually authorised for me to say today that she was originally trying to use a speech therapy model that is chronologically appropriate for my son, who is 12. However, this did not work at all. This resulted in many a meltdown and many, just, just many devastating sessions really with, with no progress. And we we're all a bit disheartened about that. My son's speech therapist was lovely and she called somebody that knew a little bit more about it than she did. And she then implemented the Lidcone program, which chronologically, as you would know, is not really used in kids over the age of five, six, seven. But for my 10, 10 year old at the time, it worked perfectly. My son's occupational therapist, 
also did a course on FASD and I provided them with some educational videos and they all watched them because they were very, very keen to help. One thing I need to let you know about my son is that he does have deficits, but he has an awful lot of strengths and he's a very, very likeable little human being. The next thing I would need to talk about, of course, is schooling. My son was well accommodated for when he was in kindergarten. He did two years of kindergarten. But when he got to primary school, those deficits really started showing through. The sensory issues started coming through. There was too much chatter in the classroom for him. There was too much stimulation. He couldn't sit still in his chair. And by the time he got to grade three, in that particular primary school, it became too large for him. My son now goes to a small mainstream primary school of roughly 90 odd students. And it's actually the same primary school I went to, so that's kind of cool. And within that school, again, they received the pack of the FASD information. They have taken it on board. Being a smaller school, everybody knows everybody. And that has been really, really important for my son. All FASD children can thrive if they're given the appropriate accommodations. These accommodations for my son look like there are timeout cushions for him. His teacher will ask him every 15 minutes or so if he needs a brain break because he's not able to articulate that. He just gets overwhelmed with the, the input. And because his processing is slower, it takes him that little bit longer to be able to process what's said. So if instruction, too many instructions are given at once, he can't follow them. But he will tell you that he understands because he's really good at social cues. So his teacher will actually ask him if he needs a brain break. And at that point he'll say yes, but he won't ask for one. He has cushions that he can go to. He has he loves to read. My son is extraordinary at reading. Within the different brain domains, you will often see that their results will be all over the place. So my son's receptive language is excellent. So he will read novels, but his expressive language, his speech and his ability to make up an abstract story, he cannot do that. It's not possible for him. So with all these accommodations in place at his primary school, he is actually doing quite well at the moment. So for any therapists, OTs, speeches, psychologists out there, I hope this has helped a little bit. Uh, my dream in the future, my, my vision, I suppose, for the future is that all of the clinicians that are very well versed in autism will be as well versed in FASD. So it's really important for me as a parent and an advocate to get these conversations started particularly for women like myself who found themselves physically dependent on alcohol and were unable to stop drinking throughout their pregnancy. My passion is what can we do for them? How can we have that conversation? Because these women, they are terrified. I can tell you firsthand, it's a very lonely journey and I did try and disclose, I did disclose my alcohol use and I was shut down very quickly. I'm not, I'm not blaming the OBGYN that I was talking to. I know that my first blood tests, my liver results would have given it away immediately. I'm just sharing my story in the hope that other women may not have such a long and lonely journey filled with terrifying nights on Google. The other important fact I wanted to highlight is that alcohol labeling has now changed. Alcohol companies have been given three years to transition but the decision was actually made in June of 2020. So alcohol labeling will be changing from this little guy here that we can kind of see to a very big black, red and white label that states alcohol causes lifelong harm to your baby. Every face D child has a story and so does their biological mother. If we can get to that story and bridge the gap, then we can get these children diagnosed as soon as possible, get them into early intervention. And therapists, you guys rock. I hope I've inspired you a little bit more. 
So thank you so much for listening on September 9, FASD International Awareness Day. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Angeline, for sharing your story with us today. Um, and there are some questions in the, in the, in the chat for you already um, in the Q&A. 